Hello, my name is Pastor Kyle, and this is Online Church for Bethel Church of the Nazarene. I'm so glad that you have chosen to join us. Um, I'm excited about the service that we have today, and I hope that you enjoy it, and I hope that you are challenged. God bless you as we worship together. Good morning. I'm so grateful yet again that we can come together in your own home or wherever you're watching us and worship with us.
Hello Church, Pastor Kenny here again, and I just want to share some announcements with you today. First, we just want you to know, outside of our regularly scheduled gathering on Sunday mornings, we have decided it's in the best interest of everyone to postpone all of our future scheduled events. Know that we'll be looking at backup dates and replacing the things that we can and continue back to our normal activities once we're able to do that. I also wanted to share some encouragement with you today. Know that your church board and your church staff love you lots and that we're doing our best to keep informed and updated about the situation regarding the coronavirus. We want you to know that we're doing our best to make the best decisions for you and for our church. We want to make sure that we balance what we're doing here to honor God, but also keeping all of you wonderful people safe. And that's the top priority for us. So in doing that, the church board and the staff here are working to make sure that the best decisions can be made for our church in the future. And I know right now during this time, it kind of feels like the world is falling apart and that things seem like they're just out of sorts and not in place. But don't forget, in John 16, God reminds us that he's overcome the world. So while it feels like we're losing control, we serve a God who controls all the chaos amongst us. And I recently heard a song that said, he takes that chaos and he turns it into a symphony. And so just wait for the beautiful music on the edge of the horizon. We love you lots. If you have questions, the staff are still in the office during the week right now. Please reach out to us and let us know. Trust your Lord with all of your heart. And lean not on your own understanding. In all your, your ways, in all your ways, acknowledge Him. He will direct. Good morning, everybody. My name is Kyle. I'm the pastor here at Bethel Church of the Nazarene, and welcome to Church Online. I'm so glad that you've chosen to join us today. I wanted to start with a scripture that has been encouraging me this week. It says this in Ephesians 3, verse 20. Now to him who is able to do immeasurably more than all we ask or imagine, according to his power that is at work within us... To him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations forever and ever. Amen. I need to admit to you that when all of this stuff with the virus started to happen, I was fearful that it would kill the momentum of this ministry. I was fearful that it would harm the church. And this passage has encouraged me that God can work through things beyond our understanding. He can do things that we could have never even imagined. And so I, it's really helped me this week to just believe and trust God more. That even in these difficult times, God can use anything and everybody and everything to bring glory to Him through these types of situations. So be encouraged by that today. I'm really excited to preach today. We are on week four of our Signs and Wonders series. The book of John gives us seven different signs. And he says that he has given us these signs so that we may believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, the Messiah, and that by believing we may have life in his name. And so he has handpicked these seven miracles. And I really like this one today because it has to do with two of my favorite things, miracles and food. So let's talk about some favorite foods here. And I'm going to give you the chance to, uh, to, to, to give your vote. And you can give those votes online or you can just yell at the television screen or the computer screen or the phone, whatever you're watching this on. Here we go. What is your favorite chicken sandwich? Chick-fil-A or Popeye's? I might get criticized for this. But my favorite chicken sandwich is Popeye's. There you go. I can hear the boos. I can hear them. I know they're there. The next one. Grandma's Pizza or Domino's Pizza? 
These are the only two options in Bethel. So, Grandma's Pizza or Domino's Pizza? I know my favorite. I love Grandma's Pizza. If I have time to, to go through the process of getting it at Grandma's, I'm going to Grandma's. Domino's is a little bit faster, though. All right, here is the last one. And, I, you know, we might have a church split over this. So, we'll just see what happens. Skyline Chili or Gold Star Chili? <laughs> Listen, I honestly, I'm not sure I have a preference. I know that sounds crazy, but I think they both taste great. I'm not sure that I have a preference. So, it's, it's interesting. Everybody I talk to, they, they act like um, there is a huge difference in the taste, and I just, I just haven't tasted it yet. So, it'll be interesting to see how our church splits off with this Skyline or Gold Star. You gotta love food! And of course we love miracles, and this first miracle story has to do with food. And so I'm excited to talk about it today. It is the fourth sign, and it's found in John chapter 6, starting with verse 1. We read that sometime after this, Jesus crossed to the far shore of Galilee, and a great crowd followed him because they saw the signs he had performed by healing the sick. Then Jesus went up on a mountainside, and sat down with his disciples. I, I just want to point something out to you. A great crowd of lost and lonely and broken and hurting people were gathering to see Jesus, to experience him. That's not very different from what we are experiencing today. And I know it's online, but a great crowd is gathering and they're watching this and they want to hear what Jesus has to say. A great crowd of lost and lonely and broken and hurting people. This is very similar to what's going on in the setting of this story. So let's continue and see what it says. When Jesus looked up and saw the great crowd, he said to Philip, Where shall we buy bread for these people to eat? He asked this only to test him, for he already had in mind what he was going to do. You gotta love Jesus. Because he's giving his disciples a pop quiz. I don't ever remember being given a pop quiz and thinking, Yes! Nobody loves a pop quiz. And I guarantee you these disciples were like, Oh no, how are we going to respond? Jesus was giving them a pop quiz. He was testing them. Folks, any good parent, any good coach, any good instructor knows that the way to develop people is to test them. And that's what Jesus is doing. He's testing them to develop their character, their faith, their endurance, their, their strength, their resilience. Whether we like it or not, Scripture's clear. God tests us in order to develop us. And I wonder right now, how is God testing you? During this time with the coronavirus, folks, we're being tested. People of faith are being tested. And I wonder how God is testing you. And He's watching our responses. And He's listening to what we say and what we post. He's given us a pop quiz. God's testing us. And I pray that you and I will respond in a way that honors God the best that we can. Well, let's see how the disciples responded to this pop quiz. First off was Philip. Philip answered him, It would take more than half a year's wages to buy enough food for each one to just have a bite. Okay? And then Andrew spoke up. Here's a boy with five small barley loaves and two small fish. But how far will they go among so many? <laughs> Philip and Andrew are great examples of who we are. Philip is the bean counter. He's the one that immediately asks, how do we have the resources? How are we going to do this? You know, it's going to cost this much, and he just analyzes it to death. And by that point, they've decided not to do it. We do this often, don't we? And then you've got Andrew, who's like the realist, you know, Captain Obvious. Well, you know, we've got these five small loaves and two small fish, but, you know, that's not going to go very far. And he's basically just saying this is impossible. He's the... the the master obvious type person. Well, Jesus is testing them, and I want to see what Jesus has to say. He said this, Have the people sit down. There was plenty of grass in that place. And they sat down 
About 5,000 men were there. Jesus then took the loaves, gave thanks, and distributed to those who were seated as much as they wanted. He did the same with the fish. I want you to notice that there were 5,000 men here, and there were undoubtedly women and children. So the estimate, as I studied this week, the estimate is that there was closer to 15,000 people. So what this means is that this was not one miracle. This was 15,000 separate miracles for each person who was there that day. That's, that's pretty cool. The second thing I want you to notice from this part of the verse is that he gave thanks. Folks, if you're not listening, tune back in for a second. He gave thanks for what was clearly not enough. He asked God to bless what he had, knowing that without the help of God, this is clearly not enough. How many times do you and I have this opportunity in our life to just give God what we have? Even though we know, Captain Obvious, we know it's really not enough, but we're going to give what we have anyway and ask God to bless it. It's an incredible moment in this story. And the Bible says that they ate as much as they wanted. This wasn't some expensive, fancy restaurant where they give you small portions this was like the Golden Corral where you get to go back 10 or 15 times and fill your plates. This was awesome. They got to eat as much as they wanted. So let's continue and see what happens. When they had, when they had, had, all, when they had all had enough to eat, that's a tongue twister, he said to his disciples, gather the pieces that are left over. Let nothing be wasted. So they gathered them and filled 12 baskets with the pieces of bread and fish that were left over. And then he says this, After the people saw the sign Jesus performed, they began to say, Surely this is the prophet who has come into the world. Jesus, knowing that they intended to come and make him king by force, withdrew again to a mountain by himself. Folks, these people gathered to hear something from Jesus. And you and I, we've gathered here to hear something from Jesus. And I believe that he wants to teach us some lessons today. And we're going to get into that. But before we do, wherever you are, right there, with your phone, your iPad, your computer, your TV, whatever it is, I want you to bow your heads and pray with me. And invite the Holy Spirit to do something in our hearts and in our minds today where we can learn from Jesus. Let's pray. Lord, we give ourselves to you right now. We just open up our hands and we surrender to you and we invite your Holy Spirit to come in and do something in, your to do something in our lives that we could never even imagine. God, would you be working in us today as we do everything that we can to learn from your Son, Jesus Christ. It's in your name we pray. And all God's people said wherever they're at, Amen. The first lesson I want us to look at today is this. I believe that Jesus is teaching us to think and act unselfishly. Folks, this is a timely message for us to think and act unselfishly. Or you might say, be a chief problem solver for those around you. That's something we need right now. Or you might say, you see a need and you meet a need. You know, Christians ought to think and act differently than the world around us. I've seen a lot of funny stuff on television and on social media about the great toilet paper shortage of 2020, right? You've seen it. I've seen it. And after I'm done laughing, I realize something. It is kind of sad. It is sad that people have all this, this self-preservation mindset, and they're hoarding, and they're withholding, and there's a lack of concern for people around them. It is sad the way that the world responds sometimes to crisis and to panic. And I just want to encourage you today that Jesus calls us to respond, to think and act unselfishly. That's what we're called to do as followers of Christ. And so just a couple thoughts on this lesson. The first is this. Followers of Christ ask the unselfish question. Notice that Jesus asked an unselfish question in this moment when he realized there was a need he said, where are we going to buy bread for all these people? Jesus could have just as easily said, hey, Philip, where's my dinner? Hey, Andrew, how are we going to feed the disciples tonight? 
But he didn't say that. He said, where are we going to buy food for all of these people? I wonder what your questions are right now. I wonder if they are selfish questions or unselfish questions. Where will I get my food? Where will I get my toilet paper? Why should I have to become cooped up? I'm not at high risk. Please don't hear me wrong. It's okay to take care of yourself. Please do. But when it becomes greed and withholding and lack of concern, you cross a line that becomes very un-Christ-like. Instead of asking those selfish questions, I think Jesus would lead us and want us to be asking the unselfish questions. Like, do my neighbors have enough food? How are children going to get fed? How are the elderly going to get what they need? Am I potentially going to be interacting with people who are at high risk? And should I take precautions there? I think that Jesus calls us to ask the unselfish question, just as he does in this story. It's not all about you. You need to look to the person next to you or just say to yourself, it's not all about me. It's not all about you. We need to be reminded of this. I remember my dad telling me about a churchman who his mom and dad were heavily involved in the church. I mean, they were saints of the church if you ever did see some. And so this man came to my dad one day and was um, being a little critical of the church. And the man was saying things like, where are all the saints of the church? What happened to all the saints of the church who would lead us and would lead me and mentor me and lead the church? Where have all they gone, pastor? And he was asking this selfish question. And my dad looked him in the eye and said, you are supposed to be that saint of the church. You're supposed to pick up where your parents left off and be the person who leads and be the person who gives. Be that unselfish person who continues to give and become that saint of the church. When you ask the unselfish questions, you are following the example of Christ himself. I like what one of our presidents said, JFK, John F. Kennedy. He said this, Ask not what your country can do for you, but ask what you can do for your country. That's the unselfish question. To think and act unselfishly. The next part of this idea is that followers of Christ, they don't only think the unselfish thoughts and ask the unselfish questions, but they also do the unselfish thing. The scripture tells us that here is a boy with five small barley loaves and two small fish, but how far will they go among so many? You know, there's a mini miracle here. A minor miracle here. Getting kids to share anything is a minor miracle. But getting kids to share something that they love, like their favorite food, that's a pretty big miracle here. This is an incredible thing that this young man offered his food freely. There's nothing in the text that makes us think that he was coerced or forced to give of his food. He offered it freely to Christ. He said, you know what, it's not much, but this is what I have. It's yours. That's what we need to be doing. Another thing that I want to point out to you here is that the disciples were good people. Andrew was a good man. He was a disciple of Christ. But Andrew underestimated what this young boy had to offer. And folks, you and I, in our lives of trying to follow Christ, people will underestimate what we have to offer. But give it anyways. Give it to God anyways. I think it's so awesome that God uses us like a conduit. God could have just had food out of thin air. I'm telling you, he could have fed them their favorite pizza, their favorite chili, and their favorite chicken sandwich just by speaking it into existence. But he didn't do that. He chose to work through a person like you and like me. If you will give what you have to God to be used by him, he wants to work through you to create miracles and to do his work throughout this world. That's what it's mean. That's what it means when we say that the church is the hands and the feet of Jesus. We are actually doing his work 
everywhere that we go. And so I love the message of Ephesians chapter 3, verse 20, and I've summed it up with this slide. Check it out. Your effort, like this little boy, he gave what he had. Your effort plus the power of God equals immeasurably more. Folks, that's what God wants to do in your life. The same thing that he did there. He wants to do similar things like that through you and through me. I love it. That's lesson one, to think and act unselfishly. Lesson two is this. God's Economy 101. We need to just briefly look at this today because it's pretty amazing. God's economy is a little bit different than our economy. In our world, we think that if we give more, we'll have less. But that's not how it works in God's economy, is it? Things don't add up incrementally in God's economy. They multiply exponentially. And this story is a perfect example of that. Why? Because it doesn't take a lot of math to know that 5 plus 2 equals 7. 5 plus 2 does not equal 15,000 meals. But in God's economy, 5 plus 2 plus God, the blessing of God, equals 15,000 meals with 12 to-go boxes. <laughs> Folks, this is incredible. What God can do with what you give to Him is so much more than what you can do with that stuff by yourselves. Christians for centuries have testified to this truth, that God has acted on their behalf in ways that cannot be explained by the human mind. We say things like, the time doesn't add up, the money doesn't add up, we don't have enough resources, we don't have enough time, we can't pull this together. Listen, if God can speak the world into existence, He can orchestrate all of time and space and those resources however He wants. Creation is at His command. Whatever you have, give it to God. Understanding that God's economy is different, it encourages us and gives us hope to offer what we have to God. Please do not limit God to mere science or other forms of human understanding. He is not confined by our human understanding or our experience. One of my favorite Bible verses, Proverbs 3, verse 5, it says, Trust in the Lord with all of your heart, and then it says, Lean not on your own understanding because you may not be able to understand it. God's economy does not add up in the way that we often understand. So I want to challenge you to place your not enough, your five loaves and two fish. I want to encourage you to place those things into God's hands and see what He can do with it. I'd like for you, wherever you're at in your vehicles, wherever you're at in your, your homes, wherever you're at at your office, I don't know where you're at, but if you're listening to this today, I want you to get rid of distractions and prepare yourself for a moment of prayer. I believe that Jesus wants us to think and act unselfishly. And I believe that understanding God's economy and believing that and trusting that will empower us to give what we have to God. So in this time of prayer, I want you to do this and go ahead and and, and, and get rid of all the distractions, I want you to ask yourself this, and be very honest with yourself, am I thinking unselfishly? Am I acting unselfishly? Or have I followed the patterns of this world and focused on my own self-preservation? How are you doing with this? Lord, I pray that you would help everybody who's praying right now to be honest with themselves and allow you to speak into their lives on this matter. Now, after you've prayed about that, I want you to do this. I want you to think of the gifts and the talents and the abilities, the five loaves and two fish. I want you to think of what is that for you that God has given you, that you have the chance to offer back to God. What do you have in this season of your life to offer back to God? What is it that you can offer to Him? And you may think it's not that great. But I want to encourage you right now in prayer to not only offer that to God, but to ask God.
to bless it and do more with it than you could ever have imagined. Heavenly Father, I pray a blessing over each and every person who's watching this video. I pray that right now as they're searching their hearts, that you would speak to them, help them to be honest with themselves. But more than anything, God, may this be a turning point in their life where they begin to offer you their not enough. They begin to offer you their stuff and their abilities that other people might not appreciate. But God, they offer it to you and you can do so much more with it. And maybe, God, you will just use that and work through them and to work into the lives of other people. So God, I pray a blessing over this group of people who are praying that prayer. And God, may we be your people. And may we do things in our communities and in our families and wherever we are that would represent you well. And God, we do pray that you would work miraculous things through us. That you would continue to work in this world through us, your church. God, we love you. We love you so much, and it's in your name we pray.